stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. My name is Rick Renner, and I want to welcome you to today's program. Today, we're continuing to look at what the Bible says about spiritual warfare. And today we're gonna to really focus on Ephesians 6, verse 12. But I want you to reach for your Bible, a piece of paper and something to write with, because today you may want to take notes. We've already looked at Ephesians 6, verse 10, where the Apostle Paul describes spiritual power. You have to have power in order to operate in spiritual weaponry. Then in verse 11, we discuss the five words about spiritual warfare that are used throughout the Bible, but particularly focusing on the word wiles and the word devil in verse 11, and it's powerful. And if you didn't hear last week's program, I wanna encourage you to go to our website, go to the archives and watch it, because if you understand how the devil operates, then you can undo what he's trying to do to you. Today, we're gonna to focus on verse 12. And in verse 12, the Apostle Paul begins to really describe our combat with spiritual forces and who is the enemy that has been marshaled against us. So we're going to begin in verse 12. But I wanna really begin by quoting 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, where the Apostle John writes, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I want you to remember that. Even though we're talking about the devil, we're not glorifying him. We're just making sure we understand who we're up against. That's why Paul writes Ephesians 6, verse 12. And as we go into this verse, keep in mind 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. But with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at Ephesians 6, verse 12, where the apostle Paul says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're going to begin right at the first of the verse. Paul says, for we wrestle not. The Greek actually says it a little different. It says, for the wrestle to us is not against flesh and blood. That difference is very important because it means every one of us at some point in our experience are going to be drawn into a conflict with spiritual forces. That's why the Greek so emphatically says the wrestle is to us. It pulls every one of us into it. And again, Paul's not trying to scare us. He's just trying to prepare us. We need to understand there is really an enemy who is against us, and we need to understand what kind of battle he may try to wage against us. And that's why Paul uses the word wrestle. For we wrestle not. This word wrestle is the Greek word pale. Now that means nothing to you. But to the Greek readers who were reading this, they understood completely what this word pale meant. It was an athletic term that was used in the first century. Let's use the example of football. If I say football, I don't have to stop and then give you a dissertation on what is football. You know what is football because you've grown up in a society where everyone loves football. Every city has its own football team in the high school and colleges have football and Sunday afternoons, Saturdays, people watch football. Football is a part of the culture. Well, this word pale or the word wrestle was a word like football in the first century. Of course, it wasn't about football. It was about an entirely different kinds of sports, but everyone knew it just like you would know the word football. So Paul didn't have to stop and explain what he was talking about. By using this word pale, here translated as the word wrestle, but actually the word pale, immediately all kinds of images came to the minds of the readers because they had grown up in a culture where pale was very well known. What is pale? This word pale, which here is translated wrestle, is actually a derivative of the word palestra. And the word palestra was an athletic complex in every major Greek city. Now, in every major Greek city, there were different kinds of facilities. For example, if it was a large Greek city, there was a theater that was very common. Very often there was a library. There was always a marketplace. There was a bulletarion. That's a place where the council met. All of these buildings were in every city. And in every city, there was a gem. The gym was a public facility. It's where boys were taught. It's where all kinds of sports took place. 
and affixed to the gym, sometimes separate from the gym, but very often affixed to the gym, there was a separate facility which was called the palestra. Palestra and the word poly, they are the same root. This word poly means to wrestle, to fight, to combat. When it becomes the word palestra, it describes a house of combat sports, a house of conflict. Though it could be connected to the gym, it was very different from the gym. In the gym, there were regular athletics and sports and exercises, but the palestra was a completely different story. The palestra was a house of conflict, fierce conflict. It was a house of combat sports. And whoever entered into the palestra had to be mentally prepared because he probably was going to fight the conflict of his life. The fighting that took place in the palestra was unlike any other. And there were only three particular athletic sports that occurred in the palestra, boxing, wrestling, and a sport called pancration. Now, we still have boxing and wrestling today, but we don't have boxing and wrestling like they had. Theirs was an entirely different sort. Now, for all three of these athletic competitions, boxing, wrestling, pancration, they fought naked because they didn't want any clothes to prohibit the movement of their body as they fought. It was very, very serious competition. And there were rules to the game, but there weren't many rules. The ultimate end of the game was to drive your opponent into submission. You could beat him, hurt him, gouge him, break something. I mean, you could do almost anything as long as you were on that goal to drive your opponent into submission. It was horrible. For example, boxing. When they boxed, they didn't wear simple boxing gloves like boxers wear today. They had straps of hide that were 16 feet long. And they began wrapping them around the arm at the elbow, all the way down the arm, across the wrist, across the hand, and often on the end of the knuckles were affixed very small nails. And when they boxed, they didn't just box, they gouged, they cut. And that's why when you look at the vases of the ancient Greeks, where often events in society are portrayed artistically, you'll see boxers portrayed with noses missing, ears missing, big gouges in their face with blood pouring out. And this is because they had been struck by these gloves that had small nails coming out of every knuckle. They were so committed to win and to not surrender to their enemy that we actually have one example from the first century, the same time when Paul was writing this letter, of a boxer who was struck so hard in the mouth, it knocked out all of his front teeth. But rather than spit his teeth out and let the enemy know he had been hurt, he chose to swallow his teeth and just keep fighting. You were to never surrender, you were to fight until you drove your opponent into complete submission. That was boxing. Then there was wrestling. Wrestling was horrific. In wrestling, there were very few rules to the game. For example, we know there were some wrestlers who would use their thumb to gouge the eye of the other opponent. It was horrible what they did in wrestling. You could even break bones in wrestling. All of that was permitted. The goal was do anything you have to do to drive your opponent into submission until he finally surrenders. And then there was the third sport called pancration. And this is a Greek compound word. The word pan means all. The word kratos is the word for power. When you compound the two words together, these were the men that had more power than anyone else. And in fact, these were the survivors, those who had survived the boxing match and the wrestling match. And now they came to fight the others who had survived their boxing match and their wrestling match. And when they came to fight, they came with clubs that were fixed with nails, with satchels filled with rocks. They did anything. It was so horrific that currently we have no sport in the modern world to compare with pancration. It was just horrible what they did to each other in this house called the palestra. And all three of these sports were what took place in the palestra. Well, now when we come to Ephesians 6, verse 12, Paul says, for we wrestle, the Greek using the word pale, sharing the same root with this word palestra. 
and all the readers understood what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, you better be serious about this conflict because the devil is serious. And the devil doesn't use many rules to the game. His objective is to drive you into submission, to attack you with every means that he has available until finally you become so weakened and so attacked that you submit and you surrender. That is the devil's goal to get you to surrender, for example, about your healing. He wants you to give up. The devil wants you to surrender about your marriage. He wants you to give up. He wants to attack you about your finances until you become so discouraged that you submit and you finally just surrender. That's his purpose. Now remember, 1 John 4.4 4 says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The greater one lives in you and you're able to overcome these attacks. But when Paul's readers read this word poly in Ephesians 6 verse 12, that's immediately what they saw they understood this was a back-snapping, eye-gouging, blood-spilling event, and Paul was alerting them that they better be serious because the devil is serious. But then he continues. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Notice Paul repeats this word against four times when he refers to these different levels of demonic power, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In Greek, the word against could have been used one time in reference to all four of these, unless the Holy Spirit was really trying to drive a point home. That's why he repeated it four times when really he only had to say it once, but he says it four times, and all four times, it is the Greek word pros. The word pros always describes intimate contact, intimate contact. The best example, I think, of the word pros is in John chapter one, verse one, where John writes about the relationship that existed between the Father and the Son before Jesus' incarnation. And in John 1, 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. That word with is the same word pros. This word pros used in John 1.1 1, 1, describes such intimacy between God the Father and God the Son that they can nearly feel each other's breath breathing upon each other's face. And in fact, one expositor has translated it, in the beginning was the word and the word was face to face with God. This is very intimate contact between members of the Trinity. But now when you come to Ephesians 6, verse 12, Paul uses the same word, pros. Pros, principalities, pros, powers, pros, rulers of the darkness of this world, pros, spiritual wickedness in high places. He uses this word pros to tell us spiritual warfare is something that comes very close to us. At some point in our experience, Paul says emphatically, we're going to have intimate contact with these powers. Now, it doesn't happen every day. It may happen seasonally. But what Paul wants us to understand is spiritual warfare isn't what happens to people on the other side of the world. It will come into your life. It's something that you're going to experience. And that's why he repeats the word pros four times to let us know this will be some kind of intimate contact that you will experience in your own life. That's why we need to understand it and why we need to have spiritual weaponry. But notice how he describes the devil's powers. He begins by calling them principalities. Then he calls them powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. These are different levels of dark demonic power. And Paul begins with the first layer which he calls principalities, taken from the Greek word archos. And the word archos is a Greek word which describes those that have held the highest seats of power since the most ancient times, archos. From this word archos, we get the word chief, superior. We also get the word ancient. So these are ancient powers, demonic powers, which have held very high-ranking seats of power, for ages and ages and ages. Directly under them, he describes a group which he calls powers. This word powers is the Greek word exousias, 
It describes those that have received license to do whatever they want to do, wherever they want to do it. These are roaming spirits that have been delegated spiritual power by Arcus, by the principalities. And once they've received this power, they now are roaming about the earth, doing whatever they want to do, wherever they desire to do it. And then Paul describes the third category, which he calls rulers of the darkness of this world. Very strange Greek word, the word cosmocrateros. Now, the first time I studied this, I was still a college student, and I was perplexed by it and couldn't find anyone that could explain it to me because really it is the Greek word for a military boot camp or a training center, a military training center. The word cosmos and the word kratos combined. The word cosmos describes something that is ordered, arranged, or disciplined. It's where scientists get the word cosmos to describe the universe. Though the universe is a far-flung place, there's order, there's discipline, there's arrangement to the way that it's moving, the way that it's ordered. That's the word cosmos. And the word cosmos very often in scripture describes something that's ordered, arranged, or disciplined. But the second part of the word is kratos. And the word kratos, as we've seen before, describes power. I would say raw power. But when you take the word kratos, and put it together with the word cosmos, we come up with a very interesting meaning. It is raw power that has suddenly been harnessed, and once it's harnessed, it is organized, it's arranged, it is disciplined. And in fact, this was the word used to describe a military boot camp or a military training center where young men would come into the camp. Those young men were raw power. But once all that raw power came into the camp, they were harnessed, they were organized, they were arranged, they were disciplined, they became troops, they became an army. There they were taught how to use different weapons, and once they were trained, then they were dispatched. And once dispatched, they are go out to attack. And this leads us to the next category, which Paul describes in verse 12, which he calls spiritual wickedness in high places. First of all, it's spiritual. So we know we're talking about a spiritual dimension, but he calls it spiritual wickedness. The word wickedness being the Greek word poneros, and the word poneros is a very foul word. It describes someone who has a malevolent intent. They don't want to just hurt you. They want to destroy you. This is someone who is malevolent insidious, violent. And here we find that once demon spirits are trained to do what they do, that's back to the word, rulers of the darkness of this world, implying that demon spirits don't do what they do haphazardly. They're actually put into training. They're demon spirits that are taught to do what they do. They're given weapons of destruction, just like troops. All that raw power is harnessed. Satan organizes them, disciplines them, then dispatches them. And very often there are spirits that do nothing but certain things. There are spirits of cancer. That's all they do. There are spirits of nicotine. That's all they do. There are spirits of addiction. That's all they do. Spirits of divorce, spirits of perversion. Spirits are trained to do what they do. That is emphatically what this word cosmocrateros tells me. And then they're dispatched. And when they are dispatched, they are malevolent. They are insidious. They are violent. I like to quote John 10.10, which says the thief doesn't come but to kill, steal, and destroy. I believe that's the motto of demon spirits when they are dispatched. They leave on assignment saying to themselves, kill, steal, and destroy. And where do they reside? Paul tells us. He calls it spiritual wickedness in high places, Or one translation says heavenly places. But really, this is confusing. Is Paul really saying the demon spirits live in the universe, way out in the cosmos, in outer space? Is that the high places he's talking about? Of course not. There's no one out there for demons to attack. Then what does he mean when he says high places? Well, in Greek, there are two words to describe the atmosphere. There's a word which describes the atmosphere or the air above the mountaintops, and there's a second word which describes the air below the mountaintops. The word which Paul uses here is the word which describes the air below the mountaintops or the atmosphere where we live, our environment. 
demon spirits are not dispatched into outer space. There's no one out there for them to attack. Demon spirits come low. That's why it's strange that it's translated high places. The Greek word really means our atmosphere. They come low into the environment where we live, where there are human beings that they can attack. Wow, this is amazing. What you really have in verse 12 is Paul speaking by divine revelation. It seems that he has looked into the realm of the spirit and he has seen how Satan's kingdom is aligned militarily. And now by revelation, he begins penning in this verse what he has seen, informing us that Satan is very serious about his victimization of the human race. And when he comes to victimize human beings, he nearly throws out all the rules. It can be a backsnapping, eye-gouging, blood-spilling event. Now, we have more authority than the devil. Amen. Say amen. We have more power than the devil. The Bible clearly teaches that. And we've been quoting today, 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So one day I was talking to the Lord about this verse. And I said to the Lord, Lord, if we have more power than the devil and more authority than the devil, why does it seem the devil is winning so many of the victories? And the Lord answered me clearly and said, because the devil has something that the church often does not have. I said, what is that? What does the devil have that the church does not have? And the Lord said to me, commitment, organization, and discipline. (sighs) Commitment, organization, and discipline. Here we see in this verse how regimented the devil is, how he trains demon spirits to do what they do, how they are dispatched as a unified force to victimize human beings, to victimize the earth when the church can't even decide whether or not it's going to show up for Sunday service. They can't decide whether or not they're going to submit to the authority of their pastor. It's questionable whether they're even going to regularly read their Bible. They love the Lord, but very often the church is disjointed and lazy, uncommitted. Says that it's committed, but its action shows that it's not committed. And the Lord just said to me, when the church matches the commitment, organization, and discipline that the devil has, you will put him to flight. Church, we have more authority than the devil. We have more power than the devil. But when we as a church are a disjointed unit, we are not effective. The devil is very committed. That's why he attacks with such fury and attacks continuously striking again and again and again and again from one angle and another angle and another angle. His intention is to drive us into submission till we give up and surrender and lose our victory. We've got to be committed. We've got to be organized. We've got to be disciplined. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit and the mind of Christ, which enables us to be that. So now, Paul has described for us very clearly in Ephesians 6, verse 12, who we're up against. And that's why in verse 13, this is where we're going to continue in the next program, but in verse 13, he says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. This word, wherefore, is the Greek word diatauto, which really means in light of everything that I've just said to you. And really, it refers to verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12. In light of the fact that you have spiritual power, in light of the fact that God has given you a complete set of weaponry and the devil is against you, or verse 12, in light of the fact there is a wrestling in front of you, poly, a very intense combat, in light of the fact that the devil's forces are so highly organized, wherefore, Diatalto, in light of all of these things, take unto you the whole armor of God. And then he begins to tell us how to use that armor to drive evil out of our lives. And that is where we're going to begin in the next program. But before we leave today, I want to remind you that if you need prayer, we're here for you. Use the information that is on the screen. Contact us. I guarantee you that if you contact us with a prayer need, we are a ministry that will really sincerely go to the Lord on your behalf. We really will. But in closing, I remind you of Ecclesiastes 8, verse 4, which says, where the word of a king is, there is power. 
Let God's word release its power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program. The devil will do everything he can to attack you, but you don't have to live defeated or under attack. You can win the battle with spiritual weapons to defeat the enemy. In Rick Renner's five-part sermon series, Spiritual Weapons to Defeat the Enemy, you'll learn how to wage war against the plans of the devil and win. When you call or go online right now, you'll discover how to defeat every lie and attack that is holding you back from your destiny. Available in physical or digital format starting at just $10. Spiritual Weapons to Defeat the Enemy is a sermon series that can change the outcome of your life and the lives of those you love. When you call or go online today, you'll also receive the beautifully bound 500-page book, Dress to Kill, for just $22. In this book, Rick answers the hard questions about the often misunderstood subject of spiritual warfare. This comprehensive study teaches you how to put on the full armor of God and the importance each piece of the armor plays in defeating the enemy. When you call or go online today and get dressed to kill, you'll learn the significance of your prayer life and how to be prepared every day to defeat the enemy. Call or go online now to discover how to have victory in life's battles with the sermon series, Spiritual Weapons to Defeat the Enemy and the companion book, Dress to Kill. Call now, 1-800-742-5593 or go to renner.org. Get these two powerful resources today. My name is Joe Renner, coming to you from Moscow, Russia. And I want to say thank you for watching today and thank you for your support. It's because of ministry partners like you that we're able to distribute quality Bible teaching around the world. And because of your support, we're not only able to air these programs by television, we're also able to translate Christian books into other languages. Because of your financial support, people in areas who have no Christian teaching of any kind in places where getting a Bible is very difficult, we have been able to distribute millions of these Christian teachings around the world. The Bible says if you know the truth, it will set you free. And we have seen this happen over and over again. We have received thousands of testimonies of how these books we've distributed have dramatically changed people's lives. This is all because of the generous support of our partners, partners like you. With your help together, we can take the gospel of Christ both to the nearby world and to the ends of the earth. That's the vision. Please call right now, 1-800-742-5593 or go online to renner.org. Through your generous support, we can continue to make a huge difference in people's lives. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. 